Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, I'm afraid we won't have time for jokes because I have 30 minutes and like 90 slides. So, uh, <laughs> hi, yeah, welcome to my talk. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, you can. There is no crazy gain here, but it's okay. So, my name is Sebastian Witowski, and today I want to talk with you about continuous integration, or to be more specific, about how you can optimize your CI pipelines. Setting up a CI pipeline is not the easiest thing to do. Because unlike with a local development, now you have to debug things running on a server that you don't necessarily control. And on top of that, there is this additional layer of complexity that uh, you have to configure various services together using some kind of configuration format that your CI provider requires you to use. But usually with some templates that we can find on the internet, we can glue together some reasonable setup. And that might work well when we start our project, but as the complexity of the project grows, also the complexity of the CI starts growing. So we start adding more tasks and more tools. Uh, we start building different versions of our release packages. We uh, have more and more tests. And it starts to get frustrating to wait for the CI uh, run to finish before we can merge your code. Or for example, to wait for half an hour and see that your pipeline has failed because you have like unused variable and that made your linter unhappy. So in this talk, I want to take a look at a few different ideas that you can consider when it's time to improve your CI setup. First, we'll take a look at some improvements for Docker images. Then we'll talk about running things faster, for example, by configuring jobs to not wait for other unrelated stuff. Um, then we'll have a look at not running unnecessary things and stopping them earlier. And then finally, I will share some miscellaneous tips and tricks depending on how much time we have left. Um, if we want to discuss continuous integration, we have to choose one of the existing implementations because um, different CI providers like GitHub Actions, GitLab CI, Circle CI, and whatnot, they all require you to use a different configuration setup. I mean, the general idea is the same. You write some kind of a config file, but the way you write this config file differs between different CI providers. So. You cannot take, let's say, GitHub configuration, move it to GitLab CI, and expect it to work out of the box. So for the purpose of this talk, I chose GitLab, um, because this is the platform that, that I have been using most in my recent projects. And also, according to this Reddit survey, it's still the most popular option. But I am in no way related with GitLab. I was not paid by them to come here. Um, I know that they have paid plans, but everything I will be showing here can be, fa can be used with the free plan. We also need some code that our CI will run on. So I created a simple project that you can find under the link at the top. I will have all the links to the slides and to the, this project at the end, so don't worry. <laughs> this is a Django project with a simple to-do app. If you don't know Django, don't worry. You don't have to know it to follow this talk. Um, I used Django for the simple reason that Django app, by default, is a bit more complex uh, than a barebone Flask or Fast API. So we will have some migrations to apply. And we will also have like more files r lying around. So it feels a bit more real world. But we just need this project to have something that we can run our CI on. So I'm not even going to explain you the code. That's not important. What is important is that I have, for example, a bunch of random dependencies that I'm installing to slow down the build process. I have some tests that are sleeping or performing some large mathematical operations. So also they are slow. Um, we also have a build process that uses Docker and Docker Compose. So Docker Compose will set up two services, a Postgres database and a web container. And the web container is built from a pretty standard Docker file. So, can I, yeah. So we start, so we start from a, a basic image. We just set some environments. We copy the requirements, run pip, and then we start the server. Pretty, pretty standard stuff. And this initial setup has a pipeline uh, that takes around six minutes to finish. So uh, here, here we can see the six minutes. And we have three jobs. So first, uh, we build a Docker image. Then we have a test job that runs the migration and runs the test. And this stage is actually badly designed because the first Docker run command here will actually build the Docker image from scratch. So I will, I will fix it as we go with the talk. And then finally, we have a deploy stage 
that takes around 54 seconds, and all it does is just prints this command. So 54 seconds is uh, the time it takes to just uh, start the job container, so keep that number in mind. And of course, this example project is simple for the illustration purpose. It's not production grade, so maybe don't use it in production. As I mentioned that my example project is using Docker, um, Docker or containers in general are now very well supported uh, by most of the CI providers. Uh, so if you can use Docker, use Docker because it will make your uh, development, CI, and production setups much closer to each other. <coughs> And even if you don't do develop, uh, development with Docker, it's quite easy to wrap a simple application in a simple Docker setup. So if you do use Docker, uh, the first step to improve your CI is to actually take a look at your Docker file and make sure that you're not doing some obvious mistakes, like make sure you're using layer caching properly during the build time, make sure you use tags, so you know which images you're actually using in your setup. And speaking of images, which one of those two images is better? So we have Slim Buster, that is a smaller Debian-based image, and we have Alpine, which is a pretty bare-bone Linux image. So who here thinks that Alpine is a better image as a base image? Raise your hands. We have around 10 hands up. And who here thinks that Slim Buster is a better image? OK, more people. Um, the answer is it depends. So using Alpine image means that you have to install a lot of additional Linux uh, libraries yourself. This will make your Docker file a bit more complex and the build process will be longer, but the final image will be smaller because Alpine image is very small. So it will be faster to push this, this image back to the registry and pull it in all the other jobs. On the other hand, Slim Buster is twice the size of Alpine, which is still not that bad because if I was using Buster, that would be like 15 times the size of Alpine. Uh, but if you use Slim Buster, the chances are that it has all the Linux dependencies already installed. So all you have to do is to run pip install and you're ready to go. Um, so yeah, um, it will be a larger image but and it will take longer to download it between all the jobs, but your build process will be much more simpler. And in the end, the choice should depend uh, on whether your pipeline spend more time building the Docker image or actually pushing and pulling it between the registries. But Slim Buster, in general, is a good choice, I would say. So one way we can speed up our build time is to not build the Docker image in each job, but to actually build it in the build step and pull it in all the consecutive jobs. And here we can see that even though we are building the Docker image in the build stage, uh, in the test stage when we ra run this docker compose run command, we will be rebuilding docker image from scratch because jobs are independent. So the test job doesn't know that the build job already built our docker image. <coughs> so we can fix that by pushing our docker image to the registry at the end of the build job and simply pulling it at the beginning of some other jobs. And here we can see that uh, the build job Stop it. The build job, build job is now uh, slower, but the test job is faster. And we are talking about like few seconds of difference, so this might come from the fact that it just took longer to start a um, job container. Um, but your mileage might, might vary. So if your build process takes long and you have many jobs, then I would say it makes sense to pull the image uh, from the registry. But if you have a build process that is simple and fast, um, then maybe it, actually, maybe it actually makes more sense to build the Docker image at the beginning of each job, because the saving you would get from pulling the Docker from the registry won't be that great. So you have to test different setups. Another thing that you can do if you end up building massive Docker images is to use a multi-stage build. Multi-stage build means that uh, you start a build in a separate image. Um, so you copy a bunch of files, you install a bunch of Linux dependencies, you run the build process that creates some cache files, some temporary files, and the size of that image grows um, big, but you don't really care, because in the end you will just take the results of your build process and move it to the separate image that is much smaller. 
And the multi-stage build works much better uh, in languages where the build step requires you to install a lot of additional Linux dependencies. Uh, but the result of your build will be a single binary, like for example in Rust. Um, in the Python world, it doesn't matter that much. I mean, if I were starting with uh, Alpine Linux and I was installing a lot of Linux dependencies, then I could get some benefits, but I used Slimbuster that had all the dependencies already installed. So in case of my particular example app, there will be no difference. Let's leave Docker for now and let's talk about CI pipelines. So how can we make them faster? So as your pipeline starts to grow and your stages starts to include more and more jobs, you will realize that maybe some jobs are unnecessarily waiting for other jobs to finish before they can start. Uh, by the way, if you're curious, this is the um, CI setup of GitLab itself. So that's, that's, that's quite a big setup. <coughs> so you might want to take a look at the structure of your CI configuration and move things around. For example, instead of running your jobs in separate stages one by one, you can run some jobs in one stage in parallel. So this uh, setup, this pipeline, is ultimately going to finish faster, except that what if one of the jobs in the stage fails? Now we are wasting computing resources running other jobs in this stage, even though we no longer care about the results of static analysis or preparing the release because we have to go and fix tests in the first place. Um, and there's actually an open issue about canceling pending jobs uh, if one of them fails in a, in a stage. But that issue is open since 2018, so don't get your hopes very high that it's going to be solved anytime soon. So there are always some design considerations that you have to consider when you're structuring your CI setup. But in general, I would say that the time you waste waiting for a pipeline to finish is much more precious than, uh, build, uh, the, than, the, than the cost of a build minutes that cost you a couple of bucks. So I would say that if you can parallelize things, uh, you should parallelize things. And there are actually two ways how you can move things between stages. One is called directed acyclic graph, or DAG, and you might know this concept from other tools. So with DAG, we can configure one job to start after another job finishes, regardless of which stage they belong to. For example, let's say you're, you have a Python package and you're testing it under different Python versions, <coughs> and for some reason you don't want to use a tool like Tox or Nox that will allow you to set up different Python environments, you just build uh, a Docker image with Python 3.8, run tests there, and run the release. You build a Docker image with Python 3.9, run the test, and so on. Um, so here we have a build stage that has to finish. Then we have a test stage that can start after the build is done. And then finally, we have a release stage. In the ideal world, all the build jobs will uh, run in parallel and finish in more or less the same amount of time. In the real world, they won't. Some of the jobs will take longer to finish, and if you have a custom GitLab runner setup, uh, you might actually have a limit on how many jobs can run in parallel, so some of those might actually wait for their turn to start. And if the image for Python 3.8 is already prepared, what's the point for the test for Python 3.8 to wait for this Python 3.10 to be built? We can start right away. So this is where we can use the directed acyclic graph and connect some jobs with their dependencies regardless of what stage they belong to. So here we can see that the corresponding test and release jobs are starting right after the previous job is uh, finished. <coughs> and in terms of code, all we have to do is to add this needs keyword that specify which jobs have to finish successfully before this job can start. <coughs> And directed acyclic graphs are cool, uh, but if you have a lot of jobs and you start connecting them throughout your whole configuration file, it might be hard to follow what's going on. So instead of doing that, you can group some of your jobs together and create mini pipelines that can uh, run as a whole. So for example, let's say you have a project that uses a different tech stack on the back end and different on the front end. That could be like Django REST framework with React on the front end. And then your backend code lives in the backend folder, your frontend lives in the frontend folder, and your backend test probably don't depend on having your frontend up and running. And also, you 
probably don't need to run all the backend tests if you only change something in the front end. So you might want to separate those two things. So we can create two child pipelines. Um, they are one is called front end and the other is back end. Um, they are pretty similar, so we'll focus on the front end. So under the trigger, we say that configuration for this child pipeline is living in the front end slash GitLab CI. And we also specify the strategy depend. So if we don't specify the strategy and this child pipeline fails, then the parent pipeline will continue running. But if we say that the parent pipeline depends on this child pipeline, then if a child fails, the parent pipeline will also fail. And we also have the rules key here, which, which says that, okay, we only want to run this job when something changes in the front end folder. And same here, we only run this pipeline when something changes in the back end. <coughs> what else can we parallelize? Um, we can parallelize tests. Most of you who used PyTest are probably familiar with the PyTest XDist plugin. So it will distribute your tests across multiple CPUs, which can give you some good speed improvement if you're running your test on a, a server that has a lot of CPUs. But if you don't, you can run your test across multiple runners. So this is especially useful if you want to like dynamically spawn new runners instead of keeping one large, expensive, multi-CPU server up and running all the time. So here, each runner can run in a separate VM. And to do that, we need to install the PyTest test groups plugin and then specify the parallel option in your GitLab config. Um, you also need to provide PyTest with two configuration variables test group count, which specifies how many groups we're gonna have in total, and test group, which specifies the index of the current group. So are we in a group one, two, three, four, or five out of five total groups? And this setup is nicely supported by GitLab CI because we have environment variable for both of those things. So all we see here is all the code that you need to run your test across five different runners in parallel. And this is how it looks when, it, when we enable this feature. So by the way, my repo has different branches that corresponds to different things that I'm talking about. So if we go to parallel PyTest in groups, we can see that now we are down to five minutes instead of six in terms of the time. But we basically use twice the amount of computing credits, because I think previous time it was like six or seven computing credits, now it's 12. <coughs> and here in the test, we can see that we have six, uh, five jobs running in parallel. So yeah, um, it's faster, but it's more expensive because uh, as we saw at the beginning, just starting the job container takes around uh, one minute. So starting five job containers cost us five computing credits. Other things that you should pay attention to is to make, your, make sure that your jobs are interruptible. Um, that is, if you have a pipeline running, but you push some new code, um, you want your pipeline to restart and actually run on the new code. And there are actually two steps here, which is maybe not something that everyone is aware of. So first, make sure that in the setting of your project, you select this auto-cancel redundant pipelines uh, option, and this will restart the pipeline when there is a new code pushed to, the, to a given branch. Um, this option is enabled by default, so you might not know it's there and take it for granted, but if you have a good reason, you might want to disable it. Um, but with this setting alone, your pipelines cannot be interrupted. Uh, they, can, they, they cannot stop in the middle of the job. They have to finish the currently running job be before they can be restarted. And that can be a pain if your, job if your job takes a lot of time because let's say you have tests that are running for half an hour. You have to wait for this half an hour to finish running tests, even though you actually want to stop and start running tests again. So you can mark your jobs with this interruptible true and this will make them interruptible. <laughs> so they can stop immediately when there is some new code. And you probably want to have this option enabled, for example, for the build and test jobs, but you don't want to have this job enabled for the deployment job because you don't want to end up with like partially deployed code to your server. So in, in case of deployment, you probably want to like finish the current deployment and then start a new one. Another thing is to stop your job when it doesn't make sense to run it anymore. <coughs> For example, if your full test suit takes half an hour to run and already the first test failed, then what's the point of running all the tests if you know that you have to like 
run the test locally and fix those tests. So you can run PyTest with minus X. This will stop the PyTest run after the first, uh, first failed test and then some next job can start. You know what else can make your CI faster? Not running things in the CI. So one of the biggest revelations for me was uh, that you don't have to run every possible check in every possible pipeline. If you have a bunch of slow integration tests, you can just run them on the main branches. For example, in my current project, we have some integration tests that takes quite a bit of time, but they check that all our apps are working nice together, so they are like testing different integrations. But because of that, our test suite uh, takes around 45 minutes. So we marked all of those jobs as slow, and we moved it to a separate pipeline that is interruptible and that runs only on staging and on master branch. And now the pipeline for a merge request takes five minutes to finish. And that, that works fine. I mean, sure, we don't detect all the bugs right away, but the merge request pipeline finishes in five minutes, and we eventually get the feedback from the uh, full, test, uh, full test run. So that's fine. And you can also run some particularly slow jobs manually or during the night. And very quickly, because I'm running out of time, and we might actually have time for questions, so I think I'm speaking faster than when I was practicing. I hope you guys can understand what I'm speaking. Uh, my, my talk will be on YouTube, so you can play it with like those 0, 0.75% speed. So uh, you probably know that you can cache things. For example, you can cache the pip cache between jobs, and that can uh, give you a bit of a speed improvement. But you can also specify the cache policy. By default, each job that uses cache will pull things from cache, run the steps that you define in your job, and then push things back to the cache again. But maybe for some reason you don't want to do that because let's say your job is doing something destructive to the cache. So there is a policy keyword that you can use to either disable pulling the cache at the beginning of the job or, pulling or pushing the cache at the end of the job. <coughs> and speaking of caching, you can also select the fast zip compression method, and that will allow you to specify the compression level for your artifacts or for your cache. So here you can select, for example, the fastest method that will run very fast, but the resulting cache object will also be larger. So it means that the caching will take less time, but like downloading this cache object in consecutive jobs will take a bit uh, longer. Um, that works really nice with the uh, cache controlling policy because let's say <coughs> if, you have, if you have a pipeline setup where you build your cache only once and then you push it, but then you pull it in all the other jobs, it actually makes sense to use the slowest compression method that will take a bit longer to build the cache, but the resulting object will be uh, smaller, so it will be fast to pull it in all those uh, next jobs. <coughs> if Docker is too slow to build your images, consider using a different build system. There is Builda, there is Kaniko. They have very similar commands. They actually have a bit of different features, so maybe one of them is better for you. Uh, you can also use your own runners, and this is a very vast topic that could take a separate talk to talk about in, uh, in details, but using your own runners, first of all, will save you costs, because you're not paying for the computing credits of you for using GitLab CI, and also gives you much more flexibility. Um, for example, in my current project, um, we have to use runners because we have some proprietary code that we cannot really push to GitLab. So instead of running tests on GitLab, we set up runner on our server. So the codes are running on, uh, the tests are running on our server, and we only push the results back to GitLab, and then GitLab handles uh, all the displaying, whether the job failed, what, all the logs, and so on. And just for fun, I checked uh, how it is uh, running runner on my computer, and I got actually some interesting results. So the build job was faster, and the, the uh, deploy job was also faster. Uh, that's the build. That's the deploy. So deploy is twice as fast as it was on the GitLab VM. Uh, but actually, running tests now took me like 10 minutes, uh, which is super weird, especially that uh, it was for those tests that were uh, making a lot of mathematical operations. So uh, I would expect that my MacBook Pro with 16 gigs of RAM and 16 CPU cores would be more powerful than a small VM in a cloud that GitLab CI is using, but apparently Apple scanned me. Uh, but jokes aside, this drives a point home that CI is a complex beast, especially if you don't uh, do DevOps on a daily basis, as I guess most of us don't do it because this is a Python conference. Um, so adding a custom runner gives you flexibility, but it also gives you another layer of, layer of complexity for your CI. 
Okay, let's wrap it up. So here are some key takeaways I want you to remember from this talk. Learn concepts, not tools. Uh, even though I was showing you how to use GitLab CI here, I think whatever I showed you here is universal. If, if you know how to use something, it's just a, if you know that you can do something, it's just a matter of figuring out how to do this in your CI setup. There are no silver bullets in terms of a perfect CI setup. Should you use Alpine image and install Linux dependencies yourself, or should you use uh, Debian image and deal with the fact that the image is larger? Should you pull your Docker image in all your, all your jobs, or should you build your Docker image from scratch in all, all your jobs? I don't know, it depends on the setup of your project. <coughs> Not every check has to run in every pipeline. Slow jobs can run manually or on the main branches. If there is new code available, interrupt and restart the job. And try to make your merge request pipelines fast and your main branch pipelines thorough. And also, if you think that you set up your CI once at the beginning of your project and that's the last time you touch it, think again. Not updating your CI is the same technical depth as any other technical depth in your code. It will make your code review slower, it will delay important feedback, and it will make your developers more and more annoyed. So give yourself a favor and check from time to time what can be improved there. But overall, a well-designed CI can be a great tool in your daily work. Thank you very much for listening. I think we have a time for a question or two. Anybody, anybody wants to ask a question, there's microphones in the room and anybody can come and ask a question. If anybody has a question online, I'll tell it. I'll look through it. And if you don't have questions now, you can always find me online. Uh, yeah, here is the link to the repo, here is the link to the slides. Any questions on Discord? Okay. I knew I was talking so fast. Oh, there's a question. Uh, ca can you maybe speak to the microphone because I think it's recorded. <coughs> so in terms of the multi-stage Docker builds that you mentioned before, do you find them useful and what scenarios, what problems are they solving for you specifically? That's a very good question. I never use them. I mention them because I know that they exist and in some sp particular cases w where you have like a huge build step, uh, they would make sense. <coughs> As I said, I don't think in Python they made, they made that much more sense, mostly like Java, Rust and things like that. But yeah, it, it's a viable option. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, is it possible that uh, you mentioned the, the custom runner? So was it running locally on your MacBook? So is it possible that you build a Docker image for Intel or something, and then run it on on your MacBook, uh, but it wasn't um, you know multi-platform built, uh, built from the uh, what is it ARM in in MacBook the, yeah. the silicon? So is it possible that it was so slow because it was emulated and not native? So that's a good question. I knew I should have like debug what's the issue. Uh, I think I was building the Docker image fully from scratch there, so I think it was using whatever architecture I have. But I know that the runners have like a lot of options, whether you want to run things in shell, whether you want to like run it in like Docker in Docker and things like that. So yeah, I, I really don't know what was the reason behind it. I just checked it, I was surprised, and then I moved on with my life. Yeah, thanks. I, th I think it might be the case, like it's it's super slow on the emulated when you build it on like Linux server, and then you pull this image and run it locally on Mac, uh, it's super slow and it's emulated and okay. built for it. Ah, so I it have to check it. Thanks. <laughs> right, thanks. I think that's that's it. Thank you very much for coming. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.